Hello, I'm Dave and this is Logan out once again for a winter walk in the countryside. Thanks for joining us. Now today we're at the village of Hinton Martle in Dorset and it's located about four miles north of Wimborne Minster, nine miles east of Blandford Forum and nine miles west of Ringwood. And we're going to be walking a roughly four and a half mile circular route We'll start and have a look at a few things in Hinton Martel itself and then head north to the village of Chalbury and a bit further on before heading east to the Horton Tower and then south through Holt Wood before returning to uh, Hinton Martel. And hopefully we'll see some interesting things along the way. Now I'm filming in the middle of February. It's another bitterly cold day. There's been a bit of a frost this morning, so we're well wrapped up. Logan's got his fleece on, but the sun is out. There's blue sky. Should be perfect conditions for walking. Do come along with us. Now, interesting, the, the village name of Hinton Martell has got two L's at the end, but the church of Hinton Martell has just got one L. Uh, the name Hinton, well that's uh, derived from Hinton, which I think means uh, village of the monks. And the Martel bit from uh, a chap called Eudo de Martel, I think was a, a Frenchman uh, who was Lord of the Manor here in the uh, 11th century. Anyway, let's have a little wander through the village. We'll start off at the western end of the village. And just by me here is what I think is the oldest house in Hinton Marto itself. And it's called Hinton Cottage. And I think it dates back to the uh, 17th century. I love the wooden door and of course the thatch. And there, just behind the hedge, another 17th century cob and thatch building, the old timbers, looking quite splendid in the morning sunshine. Oh, wow. Well, you never know what you're going to come across on some of these village walks. Isn't this quite splendid? A fountain. And it was installed around about 1870-ish by a chap called William Burt, who owned the uh, Witchampton uh, paperboard mill that uh, used to be to the west of the village. It was an overflow or perhaps a pressure control system for the water supply to houses that came from a nearby spring. And looks at there's a little low wall in front of it, perhaps for livestock to, uh, to drink from, I don't know. Now, Frederick Treves, in his book Highways and Byways of Dorset, published in 1906, described it as a fountain as may be found in a suburban tea garden or a gaudy Italian villa. And he went on to describe it as uh, a being of painted metal, tawdry and flimsy, represents a boy standing on a dish while he holds another on his head. And he also goes on to say that uh, how this ornament has found its way into a modest and secluded hamlet, there is no evidence to show. <laughs> now the first fountain was a cast iron effigy of Cupid, but it suffered damage in the winter of 1963 and it was replaced with a new centrepiece, a dish supported by dolphins and made out of Portland stone. And it was formally unveiled in 1965 by a Miss Anne Sidney of Poole, who just happened to be the reigning Miss World at the time. It was replaced again in uh, 2009, I think, with something that looked more like the original. Isn't it quite terrific? And quite close to the fountain is uh, this house here, appropriately called Fountain Cottage. And I was reading that apparently it used to be the village shop and the bakery and the post office at one stage. And right next to the church, the village hall. It originally was the village school with a, a small house for the teacher built in 1847. It closed in 1974 and the village bought it in 1977 for it to become the, the village hall. And uh, just speaking of the church, that's just over here on my right. And it's the church of St John the Evangelist. Now, the original church burnt down completely in 1868 and this church built in 1870. And it consists of a nave, chancel, north aisle, north organ chamber, a west tower and a south porch. I think it's got five bells. And I think uh, they use the 
14th, 15th and 16th century windows from the, the previous church when they built this one here. Right, let's have a little peep inside. I haven't been able to find the lights, I'm afraid, so <laughs> as usual, there's the uh, font on the left-hand side there. Fortunately, there's a bit of sun coming through the windows. There's a Christ on the, the cross on the far wall. And then uh, there's the pulpit on the right. A beautiful stained glass window just to the side of it. And then just having a look at the, the charts or, wow, terrific stained glass window above the altar. And then just look at the ceiling, these wooden panels. Quite oh, splendid. And then just on the left hand side there is the uh, organ with some beautiful patterns. And just one last thing to look at just on the side here. Looks like there's a very small little altar on the, uh, to the left of the chancel. And you can get a better view of the organ behind it as well. Now I did have a request from uh, one of my viewers asking me to show some of the, the kneelers when I look inside some of these churches. So <laughs> here we go. Just uh, showing you a small sample here in the chancel. What an enchanting little village. I just love this fountain here. Right, we're gonna now start making our way out into the countryside by heading northwards. Now, this is a, an important part of the route for folk that might be doing this walk after seeing the video. Just heading north out of the village past a house called Hill House. You need to look out for this sign to take us to Chalbury. What a lovely spot for a little bench. This is the view looking back down to the village. What a terrific view it is too. So this must be looking sort of over to the, I suppose, southwest. Yeah, there's the sort of main road that goes to Wimborne in the very far distance. It's quite beautiful on a, a winter's morning like today. is our next destination, a tiny little village of Chalbury, and in particular in front of me here, the exquisite little church, the Church of All Saints. And it's got origins from the 13th century, and it consisted originally of just a nave and a chancel with a bell turret. I think it's just got the one bell. And in the 16th century, the nave's north wall was rebuilt and the church restored in 1702. Some further repairs were done in the 18th century, including the construction of a, a north vestry and a south porch, and some more repairs were done in 1957. 
Now the name Chowbury has origins from, uh, well, sort of Cheel's Fort or something like that uh, from a, a charter in 946 AD, or it could also derive from Charles Berg, sort of chalk bank. Now originally there was a, a much larger settlement called Didlington, I think, over to the west on the banks of the, the River Allen, but that's long gone and Chowbury was just a secondary settlement. Anyway, shall we see what uh, Sir Frederick Treves had to say about it? Uh, Sir Frederick, of course, uh, wrote um, Highways and Byways in Dorset in 1906. And it was basically uh, a book that uh, covered his travels through Dorset. I'm going to have to put my glasses on for this. The village, save for a few houses, has disappeared, but the faithful church still clings to the summit. It is an odd little building to be found here alone very ancient and very simple. Its windows vary from those of the early English period to those of the ordinary dwelling house. The air that sweeps over this hill is clear and wholesome, while the view from its height is one of the most fascinating in the county. To the east are Ringwood Church and the sweep of the New Forest, to the north are Monmouth's country, Wimborne St Giles and Cranbourne Chase, the long backs of the bushless down and the wild heath, and to the south are the water meadows of the Star, the Purbeck Hills and the Needles. Well, for Sir Frederick Trees, that's quite, quite good. I think he quite liked the place. OK, let's have a peep inside. Now, I'm expecting something a little bit different. Look at this. <laughs> Not only is it whitewash outside, but it's whitewash inside as well. There's a wooden gallery on the left and the organ high up. And there's the font. And as you can see, there are these wooden pews either side. And if I slowly pan round. Look at this. <laughs> it really is something, isn't it? So there are some more box pews on this side. They're slightly larger. These all date from the 18th century and the different sizes, well, depends on how important you were. I think the large one on the right here was for the Earl of Pembroke who lived at Wilton House, which is uh, quite away from here, a good 20 miles or so that the church was actually owned by Wilton Abbey and then after the dissolution of monasteries it was sold by Henry VIII to the Earl of Pembroke. And then over here on the left you've got a triple decker pulpit. Um, they were often uh, added after the Reformation. So the top bit is where the preacher would be giving the sermon and then the middle bit is where the reader would be giving the, the gospel reading and then the bit at the bottom is the bottom desk for the parish clerk to use when making sort of common announcements. Well, this is amazing and then heading towards the sort of chancel end with the, the altar and window above and look at these Gorgeous ancient beam across. There's another one further back. And there are <laughs> the, the kneelers and seat cushions down there. Well, I've been to a fair few churches on my travels, but uh, never come across one quite like this. It really is quite alluring. Well, just before we leave Chowbury, there's one more thing to look at. Well, sort of, <laughs> not there anymore. But if you look at a 1901 map, just over to my right behind that bank, there was once a, a cottage called Telegraph Cottage. Now, during the Napoleonic Wars, there was a system for conveying messages between the Admiralty in London and naval bases. It was called the Admiralty Shutter Telegraph System, set up in 1795 where shutter stations were located every 10 or 12 miles along a route from London to the bases. 
and it worked using frames and shutters mounted on top of a small building and they reckon a normal message could be sent from London to Portsmouth in 15 minutes and an urgent pre-arranged signal could be sent from Plymouth to London in under three minutes. But it all closed down after 1816, I think. And the cottage here, which uh, would have uh, originally had the shutters on top, was still here in 1969 when it, it was demolished. I'll say it was roughly about here next to the reservoir. Well, a little update on the route. So continuing to head northwards, so we've got a couple of copses. I think that's Oxley's copse on the left and Duke's copse on the right. And we're eventually going to make our way to a a farm, Chowbury Farm, which I think is over there. And then just over the right, there's our first sighting of the day of Horton Tower, which uh, we'll be passing a little bit later on in the walk. Just approaching Chowbury Farm and a quite splendid display of snowdrops just on the left here. The odd daffodil in between. Spring just round the corner, maybe. We've just left Chowbury Farm and now we're going to start heading. Oh my goodness! <laughs> A hare has just shot across now. Can I get Logan in the screen? Just about. <laughs> I unfortunately, I had the camera going the other way. Right, where was I? Oh yes. <laughs> so we're just about to uh, head eastwards now to our next destination, which is uh, Horton Tower. Just walking along the side of this field, really noticeable how the crops are really beginning to come on now. Those green shoots poking through. Now, this is a very important part of the route. So, they're heading east from Chowbury Farm to Horton Tower. We can see the tower in the distance here. Look out for this um, trough, and you'll see a footpath that comes from the left. That goes to the right. Obviously, we're going to ignore that. You would think that our footpath carries on on the right hand side of this fence. You don't want to do that. You want to go on the left hand side. If you go on the right hand side, well, you'll come up to a dead end in about half a mile's time, as I've just found out. Well, folks, uh, <laughs> we've just come through a, a little challenging section. Uh, the path sort of, well, you can see where it goes, but I so said we had to cross a little bit of a, a damp patch. Now, normally, of course, I would have filmed this, but that would have meant having to come across, set the camera out, go back, and then film me coming across. And I can assure you, I was only going to do that once. <laughs> we finally made it to Horton Tower. Took us a little bit longer than we had originally planned, but hey ho. <laughs> we can see the tower behind me over my shoulder. Now we have passed by here before when we did our walk at Horton and then went further north. If you haven't seen that video, do check it out. I'll tell you a bit about it anyway. Uh, 
the uh, the tower is also known as Sturt's Folly. Indeed, uh, it, it is actually a folly in the form of a tower built by Humphrey Sturt as an observation tower, possibly to allow him to watch the local hunt. Now, there are different sources that give different dates for when it was built, varying from 1700, 1726 or 1750. It was certainly here in 1765, as it appears on a map of that date. If it was 1750, then um, it would have been Humphrey Sturt Jr. when he was 26. Uh, he was born in 1724 and died in 1786. If it was either of the earlier dates, then it would have, well, would have to have been Humphrey Sturt Sr. He was born 1687 and died 1740. Anyway, it's, it's triangular shaped, 144 foot high and six stories high. And at the time it was built, it was the tallest non-religious building in England. Originally it had floors on all levels, but when those collapsed, it became a grain store. And I now believe it's a telecommunications mast which funds its upkeep. So what did Sir Frederick Treves had to say about it? Well, he said, and I quote, The only blot on the landscape is the nightmare tower of Horton built for an observatory and now happily falling into decay. So I don't think he liked it very much. And it was used in the 1967 film of uh, Thomas Hardy's Far From The Madding Crowd for a scene where Troy, uh, who was gambling most of uh, Bathsheba's money away, was seen riding away from a cockfight here. Well, just before we leave the, the tower and start heading south again, just look north and some beautiful views, lots of lambs out in the field now and so the grass looking lovely and lush and green. It really is a beautiful winter's day that's for sure. We'll continue to make our way southwards, just about to head into Holt Wood. I just noticed this rather charming little cottage over there with the thatch roof and the, uh, is it oh, some sort of bird on top? Pheasant perhaps? I don't know. Well, this little section of the walk here is Holt Wood. And I think it's part of Holt Forest to the east, which was a very old royal forest mentioned in the Doomsday Book as Forester de Wimburn and Holt Heath. Both are national nature reserves leased by English Nature from the, the National Trust. Well, another little update on the route. We're now at a place called Rooks Hill. We had some fun coming through Holt Wood. I would suggest that uh, it's probably not a winter walk. Um, if you're doing the walk in the winter, I would suggest a little detour. I'll put a map up on screen. Now where I am now, if you look on a 1901 map and a 1958 map, there should be a boundary stone. I've searched high and low. I think I found it just down here. We'll put it this way. This is roughly where it should be located and it, it does look as though it's a boundary stone, isn't it? I'm going to bag it anyway. Well, we're very much on the homeward leg now, heading westwards back to Hinton Martel, basically just following footpaths along the side of some fields. Well, we're nearly at the end now. We've just passed Sunnylands Farm, so we've only a few more yards to go to get back 
to the village and back to our car. No pub today. Well, we might pop into the Horton Inn on the way back. Well, folks, we've come to the end of our walk. We thought we'd do the end scene here in front of the church at Chowbury on top of the hill in this glorious winter sunshine. We've had a super walk today. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up and a like and do leave a comment. And do check out our Facebook page, Dave's Countryside Walks. So until we meet again, thanks for watching and cheerio. Is it sweetie time? <laughs> Good boy.